probably one of the things that's the most interesting about my job is critical care nutrition. So really helping hospitalized patients recover from illness. And so there are studies that are performed. Some of them are quite old, but just showing the impact of a pet not ingesting enough nutrients while they're in hospital on their morbidity and mortality. Welcome to the Pet Food Science Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Jack Barr, and we're going to talk about veterinary science and nutrition and how those overlap and the sort of fantastic area of pet nutrition. So I want to just jump in and say, Dr. Parr, would you just tell us how, how you got to where you are? I know you're in the great state of Georgia, and I, I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia also. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, many years ago. Um, but tell, tell us how you got there. It's a very small world when you get down to yes. it. And and UGA is a is an incredible place to be. I'm very fortunate to be here at the at the veterinary college. And so um, I was one of those typical little kids who knew that they wanted to be a veterinarian when they were growing up, right? That was the sort of thing your parents ask you, what are you going to be? And I I loved animals. I was constantly, you know, back then we didn't have PowerPoints. So I used to make, you know, like charts about how my happiness as a child would increase if I was allowed to get more pets. And so I was I was very convincing. And so I ended up with, a, with adopting a lot of pets during my childhood years. And thankfully, my my, my family was incredibly supportive, even when I had birds that, you know, and parents that that weren't very nice to them. And so I was really grateful for, for that experience growing up. And it wasn't too long after I started adopting uh, birds and parrots that I realized how often they are not on proper diets and how impacted they become just in general health when they're not on proper diets. And so even as, you know, someone who was in, you know, grade seven, grade eight, I was starting to put the connection with nutrition and health together. And I remember telling my my parents that um, I had this adorable little um, bird named Sadie, and she was a chronic egg layer. So there were some behavioral things we had to fix for her. Um, but she got to the point where she was having difficulty perching because she'd laid so many eggs and used up so much calcium that she was in really quite rough shape. And I remember going to the library with my um, with my mom, and we looked up we were trying to look up bird nutrition, which there was very little published. And so we ended up looking at calcium requirements of egg laying hens and then weighed my bird and tried to extrapolate from a chicken to a, a little teeny tiny bird. And then we took eggshells, calcium carbonate, and added it to her diet. And over time, her bone strength increased. And I remember saying to them, I have healed her through nutrition. I'm going to do this as well as being a veterinarian. And so it was one of those things where I was seeing the importance of nutrition, even at a very young age and loving pets. It, it just made sense. So did the typical undergrad route. I did an undergrad for four years in animal biology at the University of Guelph. I went to the Ontario Agricultural College, and that was a great experience because we got everything from wildlife to pet nutrition to poultry nutrition to dairy and beef cattle to, you know, it. you name it, they had a nutrition course. And so there was a huge opportunity to just really immerse yourself in it. And by the time I got to applying to the vet school at the University of Guelph, which is known as the Ontario Veterinary College, um, I already knew that I wanted to do nutrition as well as veterinary medicine. And so even in my application letter, I talked about my, my love of nutrition. It was later then that I got to go to a leadership conference during vet school and I met my first board certified veterinary nutritionist. There were not any in the country of Canada um, back in, you know, 2005 to 2009 when I was going to vet school. And so I always thought I'd have to get a PhD in nutrition to be able to do nutrition. Mm -hmm. But I met board certified veterinary nutritionists at this leadership conference. And I was just automatically, how do I become you, right? Like, how do I, how do I do this? And so um, they were great, great mentors to me and allow me to see the path of doing an internship and then a clinical residency in nutrition. And that didn't mean I couldn't do graduate degrees as well, but 
it was really the clinical piece, the healing of the clinical cases was what I really, really wanted to do. So I made sure that that was on my on my list of things to, to focus on. So that was part of how I got my start. Leading pet food manufacturers, renderers, and ingredient suppliers recognize that Kemen is assurance. Every day they deliver specialized expertise, innovative products, and unrivaled support through the pet food and rendering value chain. From oxidation control and food safety to palatability and nutrition, all the way through a suite of tailored services that allow you to feel supported from start to finish to ensure you're getting the most from Kemen ingredients. That's why every step of the way, Kemen Nutrisurance is your partner in pet food and rendering ingredients. Oh, fantastic. So how long have you been at the University of Georgia? I've been at the University of Georgia for a little over three years. So um, really excited to get the opportunity to, to move crazy. down here. Yeah, yeah. After I finished my, I did my internship and my residency. So that was four years in Boston. And I was based out of Angel Animal Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to try to speed things up a little bit, um, I would not have the energy to do this now, but I combined my residency with a master's at uh, Tufts Biochemical and Molecular um, Nutrition Program in downtown Boston. And so I did the two-year master's program with them, really focused on molecular and biochemical nutrition, getting that real understanding so I could pass my board exam and then finishing up the clinical piece, which was the residency program at the huge animal hospital in downtown Boston. And so I've lived in the U.S. before, but never in the South. And so this was a, this was a big move for a Canadian. Um, I don't tell the Canadians, but I don't miss the snow and I don't miss the cold. So <laughs> this has been just fine. <laughs> Maybe if you can send you pictures. I'm, I'm kind yeah. of somewhere in between, a little, a little north and Gulf actually here in uh, northern Wisconsin where I am. But yes. we had a, a, a not, too, not too much snow winter so far. You know, I wonder if you could tell me what... You know, sort of what area of specialization of nutrition seems to you like just the most interesting to you today or how you would describe your your work in nutrition today? Yeah, absolutely. And so in addition to getting to teach um, veterinary students, which is a joy and and of course, residents and interns um, and doing research, I spend a huge amount of my time on the hospital floor. And so I'm the head of our clinical nutrition service and we established that when I came down here. And so we've been building, building, building. And our primary focus is on dogs and cats with medical conditions. But we definitely will consult with our wildlife and zoologic medicine service. I do have an interest in those exotic species as well. Um, and I'd say probably one of the things that's the most interesting about my job is critical care nutrition. So really helping hospitalize patients recover from illness. And so there are studies that are performed, some of them are quite old, but just showing the impact of a pet not ingesting enough nutrients while they're in hospital on their morbidity and mortality. And so, I mean, the whole reason why veterinarians hospitalize a patient is so they can go back with their family, right? That's the whole reason we we hospitalize them is to get them well and, and send them back with their, their loved ones. And so the whole idea of getting them nutrition to try to support them getting out of the hospital is a, is a huge passion area of mine. And so that's an area that our residents in our residency program that are training to become board certified nutritionists, they spend a lot of time focused on our critical care cases. And so that that's a lot of fun for me. And um, it's really great when you can get a lot of wins, right? So through nutrition in the hospital. And you see the success right there, don't you? So that, mm -hmm. that patient does get to go home. When you look at the nutrition of a critical care food, what what do you what do you want to see in it? Yeah, most often, um, by the time patients are presenting to us, most often they've been anorexic for at least a period of time, um, or maybe hyporexic. So just reduce food intake, maybe not completely no food intake, but no matter what, they're in negative energy balance and. That often gets compounded by that negative energy balance get compounded by 
potentially there's a, they're febrile, right? They've got a fever. Potentially there's infection. Potentially there's some sort of trauma. Heaven forbid they, you know, were in some sort of accident, right? Or have an abscess. Um, you know, potentially there's chronic illness or a new illness that we're going to diagnose. And so that negative energy balance and negative protein balance just gets completely compounded once all those other conditions start to crop up. And so we find most often we try to apply a bit of a a three-day rule. And so by the time a pet has been without food for three days, we are very aggressively thinking, okay, they're in early starvation mode. And while they're hospitalized, they can't have those same protein sparing mechanisms acting like a healthy pet would, right? A healthy pet that just say loses access to food because it gets, you know, locked out of its automatic feeder or something while the family's away, they're going to, their body's going to hunker down, metabolism's going to slow down, and they're going to work really hard to spare their lean body mass, their protein, um, and primarily try to work away at utilizing fat stores over time. But our hospitalized patients are in a catabolic state. And so they just don't have that ability. And so we can see muscle loss happening very quickly in the hospital, uh, which has huge implications for their quality of life, as well as weight loss, compounding that with them not being able to have the energy to heal. And so what we typically do in these situations is unless it's contraindicated, we are going for a high protein and a high fat diet. The reason we go for high protein is to try to ameliorate that catabolic, you know, state as much as we can. We we can't always overcome the muscle loss that's going to occur, but we try our best to ameliorate it as much as possible. Um, and protein is, of course, very palatable for both dogs and cats. And so that can help with oral intake. Um, and then we do higher fat because literally their body is geared up. They've already converted to utilizing protein and fat over the days they've been you know, in negative energy balance. And so we're giving them fat from a palatability perspective. But we also get so much more bang for our buck with fat. If they, It's just so much more energy dense than our other macronutrients that if they eat Um, you know, that if they eat a little bit, they're going to get more bang for their buck. And so high protein, high fat becomes a really big focus, again, unless contraindicated based on the medical conditions. I sort of have two questions about that one. um, It's sort of interesting to me because I've done a lot of research with fats. And I I remember sometime in the past, I I think I put some fish oil in a, a, uh, uh, you know, critical care of food. Do, do you look for that? I, I, I thought it was positive. I think we saw some benefit. Uh, but what do you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. So EPA and DHA being the omega-3s that we have the most research around from cold water fish and, and now, of course, from algae, which is which is really neat. Um, yeah. And absolutely having them included. They are considered essential at certain life stages. And so we'd ideally have that incorporated into the product. We have a lot more evidence for healthy dogs and for medical conditions in dogs with that EP and DHA than we do, unfortunately, in cats. And and that's that sometimes can be the case with nutrition was where there's one species where the the research has been focused. And so there's a definite need for more research in cats just so that we can come up with appropriate dosing for medical conditions. So for example, you know, we have specific doses of EP and DHA based on kilograms of metabolic body weight that we'll look for um, for a dog with chronic kidney disease or with atopic dermatitis, so skin disease, or um, even for heart disease, right? We'll we'll have like set levels that we target. And so we always try to get it from the food whenever possible because supplements, of course, uh, vary in their consistency and aren't as heavily regulated as what um, a pet food would be. So we'd always try to get it from the food. But there are times where we make a homemade diet and we're going to need to add it to the food, or there's times where they're not getting quite enough from the food. And so I think inclusion of a variety of essential fatty acids is really important for critical care diets. Yeah, that was my, my next question was about cats, you know, because they're really quite different, aren't they? We, we, oh, yeah. uh, we sort of wonder what, uh, what's going on with those creatures more often than not. It's harder, isn't it? Yeah. 
Well, and in addition to all the problems I talked about before with, you know, muscling and, and, you know, being in this catabolic state, I mean, cats are in a constant state of gluconeogenesis. They don't go through that fed and fasted state like dogs and humans do, right? And so they have a need for constant protein. And that becomes really challenging if they're not eating in the hospital. And so we have to pay special attention to cats. And of course, you can imagine, you know, cats that have lived in a household, maybe they've had like a little catio to go out in, you know, supervised, or maybe they go out supervised with an owner, but their world is pretty small. And then you put them in a hospital that smells different, the lighting's different, the sounds are different, you know, they're not with their family. And that can be incredibly stressful for a cat. So we also, for these hospitalized pets, while we're looking at their nutrition, we also have to look very carefully at, you know, can we put them in a cat only room? So there's no dogs barking and there's no yeah, dogs yeah. around them because fear will make it so they won't feel comfortable. Um, you know, spreading out resources enough, it's hard in a hospital cage to get the litter box far enough from the food. And of course they want separate resource locations, right? And you know, they can be so particular about even the bowl that their food and water is served in. And so getting that information from the family, you know, do they normally drink from a glass bowl or stainless steel or do they have a water fountain, right? What do they eat from? Some will prefer, you know, a flat surface or some will prefer more of a bowl. And so trying to account for all that on top of everything that's going on medically can be a real challenge for cats. And so, you know, it's it's one of those things where we absolutely love them, but we do try to get them home with their families as soon as as soon as we can because it can be so hard on them to be in the hospital for for long periods of time. There's the odd very social cat that does really well and will purr for people and get really comfortable with the nursing staff, but I would say more often than not them being a bit more timid or anxious is something that we're always trying to help with. And so maybe that's some medications to just reduce their stress so that they can they can heal. Um, and and maybe it's giving them little hiding areas as long as it's safe for them to have a little hidey spot and, and someone can still see them to make sure they're doing okay. Um, warm blankets go a long way to keeping cats happy, right? Just getting them some warm blankets, making mm. sure the room's the right temperature, making sure there's a day and light cycle, you know, for them to try to replicate what's at home. But I will say we try to place feeding tubes really early in cats to get them home so their families can keep nursing them at home because they often do so much better in the comfort of their own family. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe cats, you know, they just lend themselves to more feeding tubes. That's hard too, I'm sure. And they, they probably don't like it. You know, so. Yeah, you know, it's it's remarkable because cats don't really know that we've put a feeding tube. I mean, obviously they can feel that there's something there. Um, but there isn't that social stigma or that, you know, sort of social stress of, you know, or the the worry about a feeding tube. And so the vast majority of them do remarkably well. And I wish we placed way more feeding tubes and way more often. Our hospital is fantastic about it, but there is apprehension on the part of the family if sure. they've maybe seen a person with a feeding tube where you know, it was an end of life thing, right? And so understandably, I think in human beings, if you've had experience, it's very much often used in palliative care or it's used long-term for the really critically ill that that maybe are not gonna get better, right? And the whole goal of placing a feeding tube for most cats is so that we improve their quality of life because they're going home, they're getting fed, um, they can actually get water via the feeding tube and cats are notoriously terrible drinkers and they have very concentrated urine. So hydrating them is, is a great option as well. They can eat with the feeding tube when they want to feed on their own. And so it's just like a little ability to top them up whenever they don't eat their full meals. And we find that by being able to get them water and food whenever they don't eat, it reduces the stress on the family tremendously because it's so stressful when your beloved pet won't eat, right? Like that's yeah. one of the things that you're like, if they eat, they're well. And when they're not eating, it is just such a stressful experience for people that 
once they start doing this, we always get clients saying to this, why, why didn't I do this sooner? Right? Like, oh, I wish I would have done this earlier. Like I was so apprehensive, but my life became so much easier. And, you know, it's, it's incredible. The feedback we get, we have had, you know, pets with like nasal cancer where they can't smell anymore. So they're not readily eating as they're undergoing radiation, maybe for their nasal tumor to shrink it have the owners feeding them through this tube. And we've had them gain like 30% body weight between what they'll eat and what they'll eat with the, you know, the tube. Like it's remarkable. We give them a very detailed plan. They get a very detailed three meals a day schedule. They know how to top them up whenever they're not eating enough. They're well hydrated. So they feel better. And so it's, it's quite incredible what we're what we're able to do when the family you know agrees to have us place that feeding tube. So, well, that sounds sounds fantastic. Sounds like you're doing a lot of a lot of benefit for pets. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we could talk a little bit. You just uh, brought it out a bit. What do you think? Like, if we start with the medical conditions, what's the what's the most common you know sort of medical reason that the pets are coming coming to the clinic there? Or one or two, maybe we get a chance to talk about them. And then we, of course, get into the nutrition yeah. of those solutions. Absolutely. So, I mean, we see we see such a variety of, of different cases because we're a big referral hospital. So yeah, we do tend cool. to see the most complex and, and you know, the, the sickest of sick cases. But I would say one very common scenario where we're placing feeding tubes in cats is fatty liver or hepatic lipidosis. Mm -hmm. And then the other one would be chronic kidney disease. Those would be two that are incredibly common and we've got lots of experience with. And, and they're two things that we see routinely in cats, unfortunately. Um, and so it's nice to have this as an option to treat those conditions. Well, that sounds interesting. Let's back into that a little bit, you know, looking at before they appeared to you, but like for chronic liver disease, what do you see sort of the the things which might be the cause of it and maybe what a pet owner might be doing if, if they might just be trying to have optimum health, what they might be doing with that, uh, you know, avoiding that in mind? Really good question. Yeah, for the fatty liver known as hepatic lipidosis, we primarily see that in cats that have become over conditioned. So they, they're carrying excess weight, right? So yeah. their body condition score is above the, the ideal five out of nine for maybe way above, right? <laughs> like 40%, 50% fat. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we see all varieties from a six out of nine, which is slightly over conditioned to a pet that's a nine out of nine on the scale and is about 50% body fat, right? And the more body fat they have, the higher the risk with the hepatic lipidosis. And then what typically happens is either there's some sort of accident and the pet loses access to food. So maybe the owner goes away and they have an automatic feeder and the battery dies. And then we have this overweight cat that does not get food for several days. And that's a recipe for, for fatty liver, Right. Um, and so definitely have someone checking your cats at least once a day, never leave them and just trust the automatic feeder, right? We've seen too many accidents happen. The other thing that of course could happen is, you know, people live, you know, at home alone with their cats and maybe that person is hospitalized sadly and, and people don't know that there's cats at home that have been getting fed. And so um, you can now get all this little signage for like your key rings and things like that, that like, if I'm injured, you know, or if I'm in the hospital, check on my pets, yeah, right? Yeah, so that at idea. least, at least, you know, the pets aren't left to sort of try to fend for themselves. And so it's never something that's done on purpose. It's these accidents that that can happen, right? And so that would be one way. The other way is they develop another medical condition and they're not eating because they're ill. And then right. the, the fatty liver develops. And so the fatty liver is really a disease of negative energy balance. And so the whole key is, is getting them fed, right? And so I will say for, you know, people tracking food intake in cats, there is this habit to just sort of free feed cats and even some, you know, literature around, around free feeding cats. The challenge from a veterinarian standpoint is if you're not measuring out a specific food dose in the morning and or at meals during the day, 
and the bowl just constantly gets filled up, people don't have a sense of when they're not eating because Mm. they're like, oh, did I refill it yesterday? Or maybe it was the day before type of thing. And so we really encourage measuring a specific amount first thing, you know, in the day. If they're grazers, they can graze on it during the day, but then taking it up at the end of the day and, and measuring back what's left. So we have a sense of, are they eating their requirements? And that also helps us prevent the cats from becoming over-conditioned, overweight in the first place, because we're not allowing them to go into positive energy balance by feeding them too many or allowing them access to too many calories. So that's a really good way to monitor for this. And um, I do feel as though, you know, over time, people have just free fed kibble, you know, to their cats. and, And then unfortunately, we just don't know, right, if they're eating or not. So... Yeah. Well, let's dive a, a little bit of, uh, along those lines. I wonder what you might say about the folks. Many of us, you know, have multiple cat households, yeah. and that that becomes really a, you know, that feeding of got to one cat that's clearly eating more than the other. And how what what do you recommend for that? Yeah, multi cat households are always a always a challenge. I like to think of it as a little puzzle that we're that we need to figure out, right? And so. You know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, if I had people when they're getting kittens, because once people get one cat, they often get multiple, right? I would start meal feeding them from the get-go so that you know that they'll finish their food in like a 30-minute span. And then if you've got two cats, you know, training one cat to eat in the bathroom and one to eat, you know, in the kitchen type of thing, just using the rooms in your house, Now, sometimes you have a studio apartment and you've only got two rooms, right? You're probably not going to have more than two cats if you've got a a studio apartment, right? But, you know, we can get situations where we've got clients with, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine cats, right? And they maybe don't have nine different rooms to put them in. So one thing I've done is to use technology. There are a number of really good automatic feeders. Again, they need supervision. I don't like the automatic feeders that are just like a waterfall of kibble because cats are very smart and they'll get their little paw up there and they'll just like pull more kibble down, right? It's never going to be portioned. But there are automatic feeders, a number of different ones out there that, that people can look into that function off of either a microchip or a collar. So if the cat microchip, the idea being only that cat can get access. Um, so that's really ideal. And what you would want to do is you would want to spread them all around the house. If a cat were to walk into a restaurant, they would get a table for one, right? Cats do not like eating together. They're solitary hunters. And so spreading them out, there can be a lot of competition around one food bowl. There could be exactly, as you said, more. What some cats eat more than others, and then you can't control it if there's only, you know, set food bowls. And so spreading those feeders out is ideal. If that's not affordable, the other thing that we'll recommend doing is that people keep an eye out on like here in the U.S., you know, it would be like a Craigslist for old kitchen cabinets. Like if someone's done a kitchen reno and then get it like a bank of kitchen cabinets and then you can put an indoor outdoor cat door on it. Only set it for the microchip of one cat. And then each of them has like their own little eating hotel, right? And then you can usually put like cat beds or other stuff on top of it. Um, And then that investment's a little bit less because you're just buying the little doors as opposed to, you know, this newer technology, which is, um, you know, the having the different um, cat feeders available. But those are some of my favorite things to do to try to get multiple cats fed separately in in homes um you can also crate train cats right as long as you do it when they're younger like if you just want to have separate crates around just like with dogs but as they get older they get so set in their ways it can be harder to introduce that if they're older um and so you know for general practitioners that are seeing healthy kittens getting them started on those multiple meals a day measuring the food feeding them separately are are great ways to start them off on the on the right paw, so to speak. So, Jackie, I I have to repeat to you the statement that I'm just going to repeat frequently from now on is that when cats would go into a restaurant, they would want a table for one. Yeah, yeah, I have to give credit to my colleague uh, uh, Liz O'Brien, Dr. Liz O'Brien, who's a feline specialist, was the first person who who said that phrase. And she is absolutely right. Like just based on their hunting style and um, they're solitary hunters. Right. And so then we 
put them in their homes and they get such great care and they get a family and all of that. But then there's constantly other cats around. And so they're constantly sharing resources. And so, you know, things like having separate food bowls, having separate sleeping areas, making sure that for the you know, separate litter boxes, you know, they're, they're so different from dogs that we really need to treat them as the, as the species that they are. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thanks for giving Liz the credit. I'd never heard it before. So I, I, uh, I, I just really thought that was good. Uh, I have this picture in my mind of, yep, table for one. Thank you. Very happy. <laughs> you know, and they're still social creatures, right? But, the, the interesting thing about cats is they are social. They like to play together. They'll play, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I've seen a lot of folks with multi-species, you know, dogs and cats, and sometimes that doesn't work, but lots of times it does. And it always sort of fascinates me that they, yeah. they play nicely together. But uh, even within, even within that, you know, when we, when we would change, uh, you know, housing arrangements, we always had a, a, a nice, you know, sort of, condo for sleeping and then the the cats would come out and play together and and that mix um if you change the you know the the society if you will their cortisone would go up it's like no this is a stressful experience here and, and it wouldn't really show stress but because of their you know hormonal changes we knew it was happening absolutely and they're so good at hiding their stress and they're very good at hiding illness until they get really sick and hiding pain right Unlike me, I do not hide pain very well. <laughs> I know it's so funny because it's you know people you just oh my gosh I got another cold right or or you know everybody knows when people are sick but cats it's just they're they're the opposite they're just I think hiding is is one of the most frequent things that we'll hear or you know they're just not as social they're not coming out for their pets you know type of thing and and then that can go on for for a little bit sometimes right before they really start to show those clinical signs and so Thinking of any abnormal behavior in a cat, you know, just getting them into the vet to get them checked sure. out. The sooner we get them in, the better. And, and you know, just doing simple things like there's a really cool, um, there are some really cool devices, a number of them now that go under the litter box or are incorporated into the litter box where it actually weighs the animal. Mm. And so if you were weighing the animal and then all of a sudden saw that their weight had gone down, by 500 grams, you would be getting them into the vet clinic. But when you see them every day, it's hard to see those subtle changes, right? Because you see them every single day. And so I do believe technology is going to help people recognize signs earlier in cats because they're so good at hiding things. That's interesting. I, I have to smile with your change over time when I was working with having a, a food to aid in the management of arthritis or, or joint yes. disease. And I would remember telling people, you know, you think you've trained your cat to not jump on the counters, but it quite likely, it doesn't want to go there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the sore. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they're just, they are such smart creatures that, you know, it's one of those things that I think some of it is us figuring out how to try to outsmart them, right? To give them the best life because, they they get so used to figuring out their environment and, you know, figuring out, you know, we have so many pet owners where cats have just trained them because they'll beg in the middle of the night for food, not knowing that that's a very normal eating behavior for cats, you know, in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, if they were in the wild, they would hunt throughout the day and sure. the night, right? But then, you know, they get given food to be quiet. And then the cat's like, oh, I learned that if I beg, I get food, right? And so it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle then where then they're constantly being, because it's a reward, right? We're giving them a reward for a behavior that we don't necessarily want to to reinforce. And because they're so smart, they train us over time. So, well, I think we have time to to talk about one more disease, which I want to talk about kidney disease because it's a significant, and I think we've learned to understand a, a increasingly significant component, perhaps as our pets have aged, and it's sort of a, a disease of old age. But it you is, know, talk yeah. about lots of pets, or at least a significant number of pets coming in with renal disease. Let tell me about that and what what you feel like you can do you know, nutritionally and maybe as a veterinarian, as you deal with this, you know, really, really sad, negative component of life. 
Yeah, absolutely. I I think one of the first things I would encourage people to do is save up for that that blood work and that urinalysis, right? As soon as a cat gets to be, you know, seven or eight, we want to start making sure we're getting those baselines. If it's if it's affordable or if they have pet insurance, you know, getting it every year their entire lives is is wonderful. But, you know, for people who maybe didn't get insurance or or it wasn't affordable, sure. saving up for that at the annual appointment, because that's the way to diagnose kidney disease early. And we utilize the IRIS guidelines. So the International Renal Interest Society, it's, it's really a great group that are focused on criteria to stage. And how the staging goes is if you notice a problem on the blood work and the urinalysis, then you need a second blood work, say six to eight weeks later, in some cases, maybe even four weeks later, depending on how high the, the blood values are. And you will get those values, put them into a stage, and then you substage them. So you substage them by getting a blood pressure because along with kidney mm -hmm. disease often comes high blood pressure, which we need to treat. Um, and then we also can see sometimes in cats, not as commonly in cats as in dogs, but protein loss in the urine. So you you get a kidney stage from one to a kidney disease stage from one to four, and then you substage them based on blood pressure and if there's protein loss in the urine, and then that helps you come up with both their medical management and their nutritional management, and so that becomes really critical. It is important to know that chronic kidney disease is really different from like an acute kidney upset. And so um, the acute stage where it's something like there's an insult all of a sudden, um, that would be staged differently than this chronic kidney disease. So the chronic kidney disease is in that more stable patient than, that's been at home. They're coming in for their blood work. That's how we stage them. And I think, you know, from that standpoint, it's just important to keep that relationship up with the veterinarian because without those diagnostics, we can't often catch it early enough to slow down the progression. If we catch it early, there's actually a lot we can do to slow down the progression. But the problem is if we get it in late stage, stage three or four, and they've already got high blood pressure, there's not as much we can do. It's a bit more palliative. Yes. No, I understand. No, I was very excited when back in the day, IDEX came to us and we used our, our um, you know, I was at Hills Pet Nutrition at the time, we used our bioarchives to pull pull the pet out. And we, we you know, this SDMA came. And I, I've seen Iris has now uh, brought uh, SDMA into their staging. And Absolutely. I think really in an effort to do just what you said, to get that early uh, renal loss. Maybe even, we, I don't even know what the language would be. I wouldn't call it kidney disease, right? But it's it's early renal decline. And. And, you know, a lot of people and self-included this scene where where you can not only sort of bring that plateau out a long ways, so that's the best research, but in our case, even looking at like creatinine and SDMA, because there's no proteinuria at that time, looking at them, and you see them improve back more to a more youthful, healthy state. So that early detection, I just seem, seems like such a, I mean, we always knew it, but even more today, right? Yes. Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, you just think of, again, how well they, how well they hide, you know, things, you know, how well they, you know, are just, you know, masters of disguise, you know, that blood work becomes so credible combined with that urinalysis. And, you know, the, you know, even doing it twice a year in a senior cat, just to make sure things are on track. I'm so glad you were involved with some of the STMA because it's, it can be really hard to trend creatinines when their muscle loss is occurring as well with older age, right? It's so influenced by muscle. And so it just gives us another parameter to assess. That was actually fascinating to me as we saw like creatinine would be staying fairly constant over time. And then we'd go, yeah, but look what's going on with that pet's muscle. Well, SDMA was climbing. And of course, pretty soon then you'd see some urinalysis, which sort of followed you're already having trouble if you can't concentrate urine. But yeah, but you could see that while, you know, creatinine was staying, yeah, like that, not so bad, but other other parameters were starting to crash. So yeah, it, it's a big picture thing, right? Isn't that biology? Like, you know, you look through one window and you learn something, but if you can look through the spectrum of things, that's uh, better. Oh, exactly right. Just being able to make sure that we've got everything covered. And, 
you know, the whole goal is to get as much time with our pets. That's good quality time. And you can then nutritionally treat them. So, you know, monitoring the protein levels in their diet, you know, with cats, we don't do low protein because they are obligate carnivores, but moderating them more as they start to get to those later stages, moderating the phosphorus, not going too low early on, or we can see rebound hypercalcemias, but, you know, really trying to moderate things, keeping an eye on their blood pressure, um, you know, providing support with EPA and DHA. We have, we have more evidence in diets that have been studied for kidney disease for slowing progression. And they they always end up being a diet is not just one nutrient change, right? It ends up being, you know, altered protein, altered phosphorus, matching the calcium with the phosphorus. They contain EPA and DHA as those cold water fish oils. So we have that evidence of being able to show that there's a much longer survival for those cats. And so I think all of those things and making sure the diet's balanced is, is really critical. So yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It's time for our famous three. We, we've had, you know, I, I can see we could, we need to have more discussions, Jackie, another time. But I wonder if you could take a little bit of time. You know, one thing that always fascinates me in talking to experts in the field in what they perceive as sort of an ideal team member, as maybe someone you you might encourage to come in or you're working alongside and you go, I either want to be on your team or you'd like them to be on a team you're leading. What do you look for in that individual? Absolutely. And the the main things that I've experienced with hiring would be registered veterinary technicians. So uh, a veterinarian technician relationship is essential, right? No, no, no service can operate without our skilled nursing staff. And so that becomes really, really, really critical for a service running and, and the flow of a service and, and getting patients treated because they can do technician appointments while we're seeing other appointments and help get diagnostics. And so um, it's the classic thing, a, a good team player, right? Someone who's willing to work with a team and work hard and make sure that everybody's sharing the workload, right? That's that's so critical when working in a veterinary hospital because things can be high stress at times, right? Where a pet's not doing well, you know, and a poor owner, you know, is is emotional because obviously their pet's not doing well. And so, Knowing that your team is always going to come together and support each other, that's that's going to be critical, right? And then I think, you know, people that are are willing to take that initiative, right, you know, and start to, with training, of course, be able to, you know, anticipate needs of the service and, and start saying, you know, I'm going to trend that blood work out because I can already tell that they're mm-hmm. going to want that blood work mm-hmm. trended out for this upcoming appointment or you know what, I'm going to mention that I noticed there was weight loss in this patient, you know, as soon as I see the doctor, because they're going to want to know that and they're going to want to get a recheck scheduled. And so um, from a nursing standpoint, that's, that's incredible to have that, that skill set, right? And no, I, I understand. So you're saying, you know, that teamwork, that essential compatibility with people and, <laughs> and enjoyment of, of that sort of, because it is a, you know, that that's, that's a skill. You know, it's prep learned. It's also sometimes seems pretty, uh, pretty very basic in the personalities. Yeah. I used to times hear pe- people say like, oh, I got into vet med because I don't like people. And I was like, oh, no, the whole, <laughs> you have to like people as much as you like animals. That's the only way it works, right? So. <laughs> Boy, I, I. I would recommend anyone listening to this never say in a job interview that you, no. you didn't like working with people. That's 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 not good. That's not good. Yeah, absolutely. You can like people and animals. You can like animals and people. They're not mutually exclusive. No, right? no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I would say as far as like residents and graduate students, it's really about people that are willing to work hard, right? That uh, that I find is often a skill people have developed. Um, there is, unfortunately, as much as it's not always the most productive, there is a need to be able to multitask as a veterinarian, right? Because you have an emergency coming towards you. You've got blood work to review. You've got an appointment that you need to stay on schedule with. You've got teaching rounds you need to get to. And so 
being able to multitask in that moment and also figure out what's priority one, what's priority two, that sort of thing is, is a skill that we always hope that, um, you know, that residents can learn over time through either an internship program or early on in their residency program if they're looking to, you know, specialize along with those teamwork skills, right? And and we know that graduate students and residents work long hours. So having that positive attitude and that, you know, that ability to say, I'm going to hunker down, I'm going to work hard, that that goes a long way when you're in a in a tough program. So, yeah. Well, it sounds, do you see it, you know, if someone is listening to this, yeah, and, and they say, "Oh, that that interests me." I mean, can you can you find work? Is it a good place? Is it is there a demand out there for your residents and 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 for the people that you're you're training? In our college, so the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, in the nutrition specialty, there's under 100 of us in the entire college. There is such a shortage right now <laughs> that there are way more jobs than than what can be filled. And so it is an area with good job security. The other thing that's great is diverse career paths. So you could work in industry, right? So you could work in pet nutrition industry. You could work in any sort of veterinary or pet health industry, you could work in government because pet food is heavily regulated, right? There's lots of rules around regulation, food safety, those sorts of things. You can work in academia like me and the careers in academia, you could do clinical, you could do, you know, more of a research track, right? There's there's huge variation there. You can work in a in a private practice, a general practice or a specialty practice. And a lot of people will do their own consulting. So be that and start their own business. So be that consulting for cases or consulting for companies, consulting for, you know, different, you know, manufacturers. Like there's there's this never ending potential to reinvent yourself once you get the certification of being a, a board certified veterinary nutritionist. I get emails probably, oh, six or seven a week from people looking for a board of nutritionists to consult that I just can't take on because I, I, you know, have lots yeah. to do with my, yeah. with my academic role and that's my priority, but there is literally a never ending sea of requests. And so there's great job stability in, in this particular field. Well, that's so. very exciting. You know, I, I, I noticed you said what I often hear from veterinarians is that, boy, I knew, I knew I wanted this early in life. And of course, Many people sort of, you know, it's it's got a good, it's got a good reputation. So many people say it, but but those that arrive at it seem to have often thought of it early. The thing I I, I would build on that with is this idea of the nutritional expertise because yes. I think, you know, it it is one of the you know, if you take veterinary care as a standard, one of the very significant ways we can build to lengthen and enrich the special relationship we have with our pets is nutrition. And so it really makes a lot of sense. Oh, I agree. I teach the students, not every pet's going to need surgery. Not everyone's going to need an ultrasound, right? Not every pet's going to need, you know, chemotherapy, but every single animal you see eats. And so this should be the bare minimum of the vital assessments that we're, that we're assessing, because you're absolutely right. It's so critical for them doing well long term. And, you know, the more we chat about it with the clients, you know, then, then hopefully the more they're getting, you know, good information. And then hopefully not, you know, there's so much misinformation online. I feel bad for our clients because they're just trying to find good resources. And sure. they come across, you know, I, I'm sure you have this happen to you all the time. People will ask you about things and you're like, oh my goodness, what is happening on that website? And, and you know, it's you just feel bad for them because they're trying so hard to help their pets. And, yeah. and you know, they're being led astray by unfortunately misinformation. So I think the more veterinarians can talk about it and answer questions, you don't need to be a specialist to do that for a, for a healthy pet. That's a great thing to start, you know, for every single appointment. Um, and then, you know, referring when you need to, to nutrition specialists. So well, that, that makes lots of sense. Just to, just to incorporate nutrition as just part of a vital, a vital understanding of health for the for the world, but certainly for veterinarians. So Absolutely. just this is a this is a little bit of a 
I'm, I'm almost anxious to hear, but then tell me what you might recommend someone if they said, you know, I, I want to learn more about this, but you've told me there's lots of misinformation, which, oh, yeah. surprise to yeah. us all, the internet contains misinformation. We could almost, you know, stop. But, but where might you recommend they look or how might they find it? Absolutely. And so for veterinary professionals, veterinary students, nutrition graduate students, um, two great resources, join the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition. They have a research symposium. They have free webinars for members. And so for professionals, very reasonable to join. In fact, if you're a student in training, it's free, which is incredible. Um, and then I'm the president of the Canadian Academy of Veterinary Nutrition, and our mandate is unbiased nutrition education. So follow the Canadian Academy of, of Veterinary Nutrition. So those would be two good places to start. Yeah, two good organizations. So American and Canadian Academies of Veterinary Nutrition. Um, the other would be, I have my own website known as the Kibble Queen. If they Google the Kibble Queen, I have resource pages with lots of information that, that they can check out. And then for pet parents, I would definitely say, start with your veterinarian, right? Because that incorporates the blood work, the urine, the physical exam, you know, all of those things get incorporated incorporated into the nutrition recommendation. And then there's some really nice handouts for pet owners, pet parents, from the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And so Wasava, as it's called, um, has a really nice nutrition toolkit with a number of unbranded resources that people could take a look at from, you know, just general calorie amounts for a healthy cat to, you know, sort of red flags on the internet, like don't use a ratings website, here's why, you know, pet food ratings are a terrible idea, right? They are often based on price and where they're sold and marketing claims, not necessarily the nutrition that's that's being provided, right? So those sorts of things I think can be really helpful for pet parents, but engage in a conversation with the veterinary team at every annual exam so that you know Am I on track for how my pet needs to be doing at this stage in life? Sounds like great advice. Well, thanks for chatting with us today. I really enjoyed it. I think we learned a lot about uh, critical care nutrition and, and about, yeah, well, if we, if we, could, if we could work on this uh, obesity uh, problem and subsequent troubles for cats and yes. real disease. So we covered some space. It's been very good. And I sure enjoy talking with you. So. You too. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is a this is a great opportunity.